on the one hand, the Israelis are under constant terrorist threat. They are a people, a nation grown from refugees, from a people pursued and punished. And we, at least in the US and UK, and really more besides, are kind of responsible for their situation. And we're allies. Of course we have to help out. On the other hand, the Palestinians never asked for this. They were minding their own business, living their own lives, when colonialism dumped a pile of refugees on top of them, and now they're second-class citizens in their own home. They're suffering from state violence and individual violence. Genocide, apartheid, displacement. They're poor, no real threat to the rich Israelis, and it's our duty as human beings to uphold their rights. But what if there's another other hand, or not so much an other hand as a whole body and brain between right and left? Maybe it's not quite so simple. Hello and welcome. I'm Zilla, and this is my Athenaeum. Today we'll be discussing the current state of Israel and the place it holds on the world stage, and how that place not only harms Israel and Jewish people, but honestly also Palestinians. This is part five in my ongoing series, The Echoes of Jewish Identity, and if you'd like to catch up on what you've missed, you can click the card above or follow the links below. The year was 20XX. I was a bright-eyed, precocious teenager, ready to leave home. And I was lucky enough to be able to go in person to tour several of the universities that I would soon be mutually sizing up across a pile of overly similar applications. My mother and I entered one particular university campus on a cheerful, sunny day. The quads were green and grassy, students out in droves, chattering among themselves, studying solo under the gnarled trees, or entering big brownstone buildings that might well be older than the country that we were in. It was the very picture of the future I wanted for myself. Along one cobbled path, a young man stood, speaking earnestly to any who would listen, and sometimes to everyone at large. He had a stack of colorful flyers, and as we passed, he handed one to me. It read, Boycott Israel, Free Palestine. I was a little taken aback. Not quite as taken aback as I was to hear his words. There's a genocide in the Middle East that the U.S. is doing nothing about. The Jews are bombing Palestinian civilians and children. We have to stop them. We have to drive the Zionists out from the river to the sea. The sunny day no longer felt warm. The campus so picturesque, turned gray and cold in my eyes. I looked out over the quad and saw that here and there, dotting across the campus, were more earnest young people with the same speech on their lips. The message that came through to me loud and clear was that I, the Jew, was somehow participating in this genocide that for all that I had never set foot in Israel, in fact, was quite insistent that there should be peace going forth in the Middle East, I was the enemy. 
And for all that I hadn't been recognized on sight, I would always be tainted with the stain of Islamophobia from the river to the sea. Now, wait a second. That speech seemed almost innocuous. And I certainly haven't been shy in sharing my serious criticisms of Israel's treatment and violence towards the Palestinians and their Arab neighbors. So why did that hit me so hard? Well, let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Those who say that Israel cannot accept a two-state solution are in some ways correct. Terrorist groups like Hamas and the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood have repeatedly made it clear that once they establish solid bases nearby, they will continue their campaign until every last Jew is wiped out from the river to the sea. Now, that slogan cuts both ways, and there are leftist activists who will quite rightly point out that it was conceived to mean not genocide, but freedom, a one-state solution where all of the people between the river and the sea have a right and a stake in their own country in that area. Which is a solution that seems popular with non-extremists on all sides. But it retains that violence because of the history of anti-Judaic rhetoric and because there are those people who do mean extermination. Again, I find myself coming back to those damnable protocols. There was a time when Jews were common throughout the Arab world. They were second-class citizens, to be sure, and there were occasional problems, but overall they warranted a certain amount of respect as fellow Abrahamic scholars. Then the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the colonialism that came from it, and the Zionist movement built tensions all throughout the Levant. And when the protocols were subsequently translated into Arabic, well... The protocols' propaganda spread like wildfire when it hit the Arab nations, and it's still widely influential today. There was a, a television show in 2001 that dramatized large portions of the protocols, and Leaders of places like Egypt and Iraq, and of course Hamas, have openly stated things that suggest they believe that Jews are out to exterminate Islam, or Arabs, or that the Holocaust didn't happen. Between the political tension and the propaganda, the spark of anti-Judaic sentiment burns bright throughout the Arab world. According to ADL's 2019 Global 100 study, the countries of the Middle East and North Africa have a 74% anti-Semitic bias. And it spikes to 93% within Gaza and the West Bank. This is compared with 34% in Eastern Europe, 24% in Western Europe, and just 19% across the Americas. Now, of course, that does not mean that everyone with a little anti-Judaic bias wants us all dead. And it also doesn't mean that Israel or Jews in general are free from Islamophobia or demonizing the other. I've tried to point out along the way that the Israeli government pushes the idea that they're under siege and all of their aggression is justified in fighting off the evil Palestinians. 
they've even tried to justify the settlements. But no matter Israeli Islamophobia, it doesn't excuse anti-Semitism any more than the other way around. Now, all that does not make peace impossible, but as long as the leaders throughout the area, and I want to stress again that I do mean all of the leaders in the area, as long as they rule by fear and demonization of the other, that divide will only get bigger. There will only be more deaths and the prejudice that divides Israeli Jews from their Muslim neighbors will only get more bitter. I was raised an outsider, but I was afforded one chance to see it for myself, if from a skewed angle. Birthright. Birthright is the name of an entire industry funded by the Israeli government in which Jews from around the diaspora, below the age of 26, are offered a free trip to and tour of Israel. The goal of this expenditure is to connect diasporic Jews with their heritage and homeland. In other words, to bring in more young people to bolster the IDF and the religious community. I dithered for years over whether or not to go. On the one hand, I was never going to move to Israel, and as I got older I was increasingly aware of the terrible complexity of the political situation. I knew that the propaganda I was going to be force-fed would annoy and worry me. But on the other hand, as someone who loves both travel and history, a free trip to a part of the world I've never been to with guided tours around some of the oldest possible sites, it was tempting. I'd turned 26 before I made up my mind, and I thought, well, that settles it. I'm just not eligible anymore anyway. And then somebody told me about a trip just for 26-year-olds with a focus on politics and history, where they openly promised to keep the proselytizing to a minimum. So I went. <laughs> As I predicted, I found the trip both fascinating and horrifying. I'll spare you the touristy details about things like riding camels and climbing Masada in the pre-dawn so that we could watch the sunrise. Yeah, we did those things, and yeah, I enjoyed them, mostly. The most important parts of the trip to me were, I suspect, some of the least important for everyone else. For instance, our tour bus came not only with an Israeli guide and an American Israeli guide, both of whom had seen combat with the IDF, but also a current IDF member, younger than all of us due to the IDF's enlistment policies, who was to be our official guard, and carried a gun. I was pursued by the thought that we were surrounded by people who might have killed someone. I'm not exactly surrounded by army vets at home. That kind of thing is very unnerving to me. And before you start Talking about the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, yes, it does need to exist. I, I'm sorry, it does. Israel isn't making up the threats from the Arab League or from terrorists. There are people trying to kill them. I hope I've made that clear. If I haven't, check out the Yom Kippur War, when the Arab League decided to coordinate an attack for the highest holy day of the year when they knew everybody would be weakened by fasting. I don't want to get too far into this, but just a note, the Yom Kippur War is also known as a couple of other things, including the Ramadan War, since it was, coincidentally, the month of Ramadan. But there are a few key differences between 
the attackers doing so during their holy month and the Israelis being attacked on Yom Kippur. Um, first of all, the attackers knew ahead of time and could plan. Um, second of all, for Yom Kippur, you start fasting the night before, and for the Arabs, they would fast during the day. Uh, and thirdly, well, Ramadan continues throughout an entire month, meaning that while you are fasting during the day and taking extra time out, you keep living your normal life. Whereas Yom Kippur being concentrated into one day, people are meant to stop what they're doing and take that day of reflection. So really that's the part that's relevant. Oh, and a note to the note, it ended up being a proxy war between the US and the Soviet Union anyway, so colonialism, woo. Anyway, as a result of that attack, it's Israeli policy that all young people from the age of 18 to 21 serve the IDF somehow, unless they can claim a very small number of exceptions. That means that they have to have their weapon on them and ready at all times. Israelis are perforce inundated with gun knowledge, gun safety, and gun usage. But guns are not a symbol of safety. Not to me and not to them. The Israeli attitude towards weaponry might be casual compared to mine, but they understand the necessity of them. These aren't toys for killing off criminals in some kind of macho fantasy. These are tools for killing other humans. Other Americans on the trip told me how safe they felt with all these guns on view. After all, how could any bad guy with a gun get to us through all those good guys with guns? I asked a couple of them whether they'd ever handled a gun, and was unsurprised to learn that they hadn't. I have. I know what it is to shoot a gun. I know what it can do. And I know how to be as safe as you can be. It didn't take much for me to imagine that young soldier having to take out his weapon. To imagine a firefight with bullets flying through the bus, or through stalls at the market, or across the beachfront. I didn't feel safe. Once I ran into a young man's assault rifle butt while I was walking through a bakery. He didn't even flinch. My skin was crawling. Once, after a night on the town when most everyone else was drunk and a little too loud and I happened to have a migraine, I sat in the front of the bus with our young IDF guard and made a pained joke about taking his gun and shooting everyone to shut them up. He very nearly handed it to me in jest. I did not feel safe. I felt even less safe when, at one point, I noticed our bus going through an armed checkpoint on the road. So I asked the tour guide what was going on. It turned out we were going to stay the night in a kibbutz inside the West Bank. In a settlement. I think if I'd been a few years older, I would have had a panic attack. I... That was not mentioned on the itinerary. The settlements I'm referring to here are where Israel has encouraged Israeli citizens and sometimes American Israelis to go in and settle on Palestinian territory therefore reclaiming it for Israel. It's a vicious displacement tactic, and it's not all that dissimilar to what the US and Canada did in breaking a number of treaties with Native Americans, where homesteaders would come in and annex the land de facto. It's 
an absolutely abhorrent practice, and it's one which most American Jews are firmly against. To be fair to the tour, they did spend a lot of time trying to show us the darker sides of Israeli politics, and that night at the kibbutz we spent a great deal of time talking about settlements and their fraught position within Israeli tensions with the Palestinians in specific and the Middle East in general. I thought it might be just a smidge undercut by the setting, though. Back in Israel proper, the tour set us up with a long Q&A session with some volunteer Arab Israelis, activists by default, fighting for Muslim rights in a country devoted to the interest of Jews. The tour also took us up on a ridge overlooking a city where you could see, even from afar, the fence dividing the Palestinian ghetto, a shanty town, from the thriving Jewish city beyond. And we talked about apartheid. And we went up the Golan Heights and looked down at the border, the lush, green Israeli side, the waters diverted away from their desert neighbors. We also met up with a group of IDF veterans, people our own age. The one I spoke to the most had been a diplomat, a translator in the Egyptian embassy. Not all of us are fighters, she told me. Not all of us think war is the answer. She also told me about her hometown in the Negev, a place routinely targeted by Hamas weaponry, bombs that threatened her family and her neighbors. It's not safe. Before I went there, I didn't really know much about Israel properly. I've had other friends with a similar upbringing tell me that they were taught to believe that Israel had been a barren place in the desert until we Jews brought it to life. I either missed out on that or ignored it as obvious propaganda. Instead, most of what I learned growing up about Israel came from Anglophone media coverage. And I have to say, what I learned there is not very comforting. Politically, Israel and the US have always been allies, especially under right-wing presidents. But just because the right wants a Jewish state in the Middle East, as I've mentioned, it does not follow that they actually like or even tolerate the Jewish people. I'll let Renegade Cut explain further. For our purposes, when the term premillennial dispensationalism is used here, it will be shorthand for pre-tribulational dispensational premillennialism espoused by evangelical Protestant Christians. That's just really cumbersome, so premillennial dispensationalism for short. This is what Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins helped popularize. To LaHaye and everyone who bought into this, the end times go thusly. First, the rapture happens, and true Christians disappear from earth and appear in heaven. Then there are seven years of tribulation, bad times with the Antichrist. Then we get our thousand years of good times before the final judgment. The rapture excites Americans because it taps into their survivalist frontier spirits, manipulating them into believing they will be among the chosen few selected by God. So they better get ready to be raptured, or if they do not initially make the cut, build a shelter and buy seven years worth of canned foods. If the view of premillennial dispensationalism is that Jesus Christ will return to murder everyone, that should be cause for concern and public scrutiny of the belief. Pre-tribulation rapture has become so popular that one might incorrectly assume that it was always part of church doctrine, or that it at least has been around since the Reformation or something. But the reality is that the doctrine contained in Left Behind is fairly recent, at least by the standards of how long Christianity and Judaism have existed. 
John Nelson Darby planted the seeds of this dispensational thought in the 19th century, but here in America, we like media more than sermons, and it took a popular book by William Eugene Blackstone called Jesus is Coming for it to enter the popular consciousness. This was in 1878. This means that while the rapture is only a small blip in the history of most countries, it has been a topic in Christianity for a large percentage of the comparatively short history of America. So if the rapture seems ubiquitous in America, but not in other countries with high Christian populations, that may be why. The rapture grew because of books and movies, notably Hal Lindsey's The Late Great Planet Earth and the incredibly creepy film A Thief in the Night. Then LaHaye and Jenkins put Left Behind together in 1995, and wouldn't you know it, this was right around the time when the internet could help this spread like a plague. Left Behind and other rapture doctrines use unrelated and misinterpreted Bible passages out of context and form a narrative that does not actually exist in scripture. It might be helpful to understand just who Tim LaHaye was. He was an evangelical Christian minister who was heavily involved in politics. In 1979, he encouraged Jerry Falwell to found the Moral Majority, where he sat on its board of directors. The Moral Majority worked towards limiting rights for homosexuals and championed other socially conservative causes. LaHaye was even co-chairman of Republican Jack Kemp's 1988 presidential campaign, at least until the author's deeply anti-Catholic views were known. Oh yes, LaHaye hated Catholics as much as he hated homosexuals and women's rights. He believed in the Illuminati, organized by the devil himself, and he made no secret that he was in opposition to the NAACP, an organization that supports civil rights and hopes to end racial discrimination. To LaHaye, civil rights were destroying America. LaHaye supported Dominionism, the movement to make the United States of America a Christian theocracy. LaHaye founded the Council for National Policy, a conservative activist group. A 1999 speech by then-Governor George W. Bush to the council helped him gain a lot of support among social conservatives, leading to his presidential bid in 2000. The point is this. Left Behind is not just religious. It's not just about matters of private, personal faith. It has an overt political agenda, specifically for America. The brilliance of Left Behind is that it uses its poorly written fiction and poorly acted movies to advance political change. The real danger of premillennial dispensationalism is that believers take this view and follow it into the political arena, either as voters or as elected officials. Social conservatives in America want the population to believe climate change is a hoax, and one of the tools they use is rapture theology. Disasters are blamed on prophecy instead of natural phenomena, some of which is influenced by human effect on the environment. Ever heard a preacher or Christian conservative politician say that a hurricane was God's wrath on homosexuals or feminism? It's ignorant, sure, but it's also a means in which to obfuscate the causes of climate change, just like Tim LaHaye wanted. Left Behind supports military expansion in the Middle East and strengthening ties to America's greatest military ally in the region, Israel. Premillennial dispensationalists and evangelical Christians in general believe that this is the land of Jesus Christ's return. Evangelicals hoping to keep Israel a Jewish state might seem contradictory, but not if you listen to the eschatological endgame. A lot of Christian end times theology revolves around the idea that the Jewish people must control Israel, specifically Jerusalem and the Dome of the Rock. These events, they believe, are necessary for the return of Christ. American ties with Israel are a lot more complicated than that, but this eschatological aspect of it bolsters American public support of the two nations' continued relations. Evangelicals control more than 60,000 American radio stations. They meet in 25,000 member megachurches. They are everywhere from local school boards to Congress. Evangelical is poorly defined as it can sometimes include and sometimes exclude some Christian denominations, but by most accounts, they are about one quarter or one third of America. Belief in the rapture exists elsewhere in the world, but when people say it is a uniquely American problem, it is a reference to both these demographic statistics and to its effect on American military interventionism in the Middle East. To sum up, the rapture is definitely not real, even for devout Christians, and belief in an imminent doomsday has had, and will continue to have, severe political and environmental consequences. But that's the conservative view. Luckily for me, I was raised in a left-leaning family. 
So what did the liberal media have to say about Israel? It feels like a constant barrage of war. War in the Middle East is covered unceasingly, while other parts of the world go unnoticed and underserved. For a long time, reporters on the war in the Middle East have complained of pressure to speak based on Israeli military talking points, not only from the military, but also from their U.S. home offices. And while that feeling has been somewhat tempered by the growing sensitivity of the American left to Palestinian concerns, it's never gone away. And that leads to resentment among the journalists who are risking life and limb to bring us as much truth as they can. Which means that anti-Judaic stories get underreported. I'm certainly not saying that there's any military equivalence between a well-funded, well-backed, high-tech nation with anti-missile technology and a poor, oppressed group scrabbling in the dirt after resource theft and war have left them high and dry. There's not none at all. I'm also not saying that you shouldn't care. Of course you should care. Of course there is something here that needs to change. And it's not any more or any less important than other similar conflicts around the world. What I am saying is that things have gotten unbalanced. At the point at which you're inundated with war in the Middle East, and everyone knows about it as this great conflict, but they've never heard about what's happening in the Philippines or Venezuela, it starts to look less justified and more like anti-Semitic hyper-scrutiny. I should acknowledge here that there are a couple other reasons why this conflict is particularly compelling to a lot of Anglophones. Most Anglophone cultures are highly Christian and highly Islamophobic, and seeing our ally Israel conquer and dominate those dirty Muslims, I guess, it's something a lot of people want to see, even if they don't expect it to bring about the apocalypse. <laughs> Israel is also the location of a number of sites that are the holiest in the Abrahamic faiths. And that kind of religious conflict? Well, that's attractive to rubberneckers of all types. But none of that contradicts the scrutiny being anti-Semitic. It just also happens to be Islamophobic and Christian chauvinist. The overinflated focus on Israel in the media, combined with reporters' pressure to lionize Israel and corresponding reluctance to report on the threats to its citizens, well, it makes the whole thing seem black and white. It makes things seem simple, seem safe. After all, Israel has the IDF, the Iron Dome, all of the resources and international allies. But I hope I've shown you that it's not simple and it's not safe. Not for the citizens on either side. Nothing is going to change while we, the world, view Israel and the Muslim world as monoliths. We have to acknowledge and start to unpack the anti-Semitism and the Islamophobia inherent in how we view them.